Thanks for coming. Uh, Easter Sunday, church, it's a good day to celebrate the great things that God has done for us. And we love to celebrate Easter around here, just remembering what Jesus did on the cross, but also his resurrection, overcoming every enemy for us. Anybody grateful for that? Come on. So thanks for being here today. Um, our church has actually been in a bit of a season exploring the goodness of God. And Psalm 45 talks about the idea that my heart overflows with a good theme. And it's just a theme that's been in my heart for several months and, and I can't get away from it. And I thought this would be a great day for us just to keep talking about the goodness of God. And for you, maybe you're a first time guest, maybe we haven't seen you in a long time, or maybe you've been around for a while, but uh, I don't believe we could get too much talk about the goodness of God. So I wanna talk about it for a few moments today. I'm not sure what your perspective is on God. I mean, how, how you were raised, how you were taught, um, you know, as you, were, as you grew up from your parents or from somebody that spoke into your life or where your background was in church life. And um, I do realize that some people were taught things about God and maybe didn't get the whole picture. Um, I also realize that some people have made up their own version of God and uh, they kind of grab different ideas from all over the place. Uh, and all of us have had some kind of influences that either within our own head or um, people that, that had an influence on our life kind of got us thinking a certain way about God. And so you might think God is mad uh, and just on the edge, the verge of being ticked off or he's aggravated with you or wants to, is just distant from you and doesn't really care to get involved in your daily world or maybe God is just waiting uh, for you to mess up uh, so that he can let you have it. Uh, but the Bible actually reveals God as a good God who wants to do good things for us. Anybody grateful for that? And I think it's very important to understand because Christianity is not about you and I trying to be good enough to earn God's approval uh, because everybody has messed up and everybody does mess up. But Christianity is really about opening your heart to receive the goodness of God coming into your life. Christianity is about learning how to live a God-helped life kind of life, a, a God-empowered kind of life. And I think we, we, we lose track of what the real story is when we get focused on how good am I being because the real story is about His goodness. And I think if we can open our heart to His goodness, it will transform our life. So there's quite a few scriptures that we're journeying through, and I'm just thinking about these, and I wanted to share a couple with you this morning to get us going, but what does the Bible really say about the character and the nature of God? James 1.17 says, every good thing, everybody say every good thing. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In other words, if you wake up in a bad mood, God is not in a bad mood. If, if, if you fussed at each other in the car on the way here, God still loves you. And he's leaning in with his goodness. I, I saw a mom checking a kid in. I could tell the kid had lost its joy and I, uh, just crying red eyes and just bugged about something. And I was watching that mom try to keep her joy. And uh, just good to know that God doesn't wake up in a bad mood ever. He always, he always is leaning in with goodness to our life. No variation, no shifting shadow, the Bible says. Psalm 119, verse 68, a psalmist talking about God says, you are good and you do good. That's simple and straightforward, isn't it? Psalm 23, 6 says, Surely your goodness and your unfailing love are going to pursue me 
all the days of my life, and I'm going to live or dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 27, 13 says, I would have despaired. I would have lost my hope unless I'd believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Psalm 31, 19, which is kind of where we're going to park for a few moments today. How great is your goodness which you've stored up for those who fear you, who you lavish it, your goodness, on those who come to you for protection, you're blessing them before the watching world. You got to remember that God isn't just interested about doing something on the inside of you. He wants his blessing to be evident on your life. And so this word goodness, you know, what is, what is the goodness of God? And this word goodness that's translated from a Hebrew word, um, it, it could be translated several different ways, but these are the kind of things that would pursue us when we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. These are kind of things that would be coming our way. These are the kind of things that are stored up for us. And so this word could be translated this, this word goodness. Beautiful things are pursuing us, enjoyable things, good or good things, gracious things, happiness or happy things, pleasant things, prosperity, richer things are things that are good. So I don't know where your stance is and where your heart is in relation to God, but I'm here to tell you from the Bible, our God is a good God who wants to do good things in your life if you'll allow him into your world. Come on. And so where I want to park for just a couple of minutes today is this Psalm 31 And I love the reading of Psalms because it's David processing life. He's processing what's going on in in particular seasons and chapters of his life. And um, Psalm 31 is King David processing a pretty difficult chapter in his life because his son, Saul Absalom, is standing at the gate of the city. And people who are coming into the city to see King David uh, Absalom is standing by the gate and he, as they come in, he's pulling them aside and he's going, oh, if I was only your king, this is what would be happening for you. Oh, if I was your king, then you would find that I re- there's somebody who really cares about you. If, you, if I was your king, I, you would know I feel your pain. And He's, the Bible says he's stealing the heart of the nation away from David. He's standing without the weight of leadership, but he's promising things that he doesn't even know if he could deliver or not. There's a particular pain in our hearts when someone close to us, someone we've let into our inner circle. It's one thing when somebody outside of us is betraying our trust. But when somebody that is in your inner circle, somebody you've let into your heart, some family member, some, you know, co-worker that you've really engaged uh, in uh, work together with, uh, or someone that is close to you betrays you, it is such a hurtful thing. When a spouse betrays you, when a family member, a co-worker, a business partner, a, a friend betrays you. And this is what David is, right in this chapter, uh, or in this Psalm 31, he's processing the pain of all that, but he's also remembering the promise. And what I love about the Bible is it's never saying ignore the pain. It's just always saying to you recognize that the promise is bigger than the pain. The pain is real, but the promise is bigger. (laughs) The promise is greater. And so in the midst of all this heartache that David is encountering, he's reminding himself of the goodness of God. And he's reminding us in this day of the goodness of God. So Psalm 31 verse 19 says this, how great is your goodness, which you've stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it, not just sparing, but lavish your goodness on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. You hide them, verse 20, in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracies of man. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife 
of tongues. <laughs> Those are powerful words. Let me give you this thought. You can hide your soul in the shelter of God's goodness. You ever heard this saying? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is the biggest lie that has ever been told. <laughs> has there ever been a more untrue saying? Because when your parents say words that pierce your heart, you can't tell me that doesn't hurt. When your teacher or your lover or your friend, sometimes even just voices from the crowd are spreading lies about you, speaking negative about you, that is never fun. You're a kid growing up and kids just love to make up names, chicken legs, Dumbo, four eyes. And we, we live in a world where people can anonymously shame someone they don't even know. They, they, they have heard of them, they know about them, but here you could have this guy who's living in his mama's basement doing nothing with his or her life and they can go online and just type the meanest shaming words. If you've, if you've ever had someone talk bad about you, then you know how it feels. And I just want to say that a lot of times, people will talk about you and they'll spread lies, but I think we also got to remember that sometimes they talk about you and they're just telling the truth. <laughs> I know, sorry. <laughs> the beauty of our God is he knows all the truth and still loves you anyway. And he knows all the lies and he still loves you anyway. And he still, no matter what is going on in your world, he still leans in with his goodness toward you. You can hide your soul in the shelter of God's goodness. Come on, somebody. I love the way Tim Keller phrased this. He said, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we're more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Psalm 31 verse 21, I'll we'll give you another idea. It says, blessed be the Lord for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. And this is a great idea to think about. God can still bless you in the midst of difficult circumstances. There's, no, there's, there's nothing in your circumstance, your surroundings, your opposition, your obstacles, your difficulties that's actually greater than the goodness of God. And I think, I think that to think about this idea, blessed be the Lord who's made marvelous his loving kindness or his goodness to me in a besieged city. You know, besieged is the idea of a city that is surrounded by people who are not letting any goods or anything come into the city. The city is stuck and there's nothing good happening and they're not letting anything get out of the city. 
And I think a lot of people feel like they live in a besieged state right now. It's like none of the good things that we're way, wishing would be happening are not coming into our life. We can't seem to break out of this stuck place, break out of this you know, place. And so what he's saying here, what I love about this phrase is this, the circumstances of the city are besieged, but the condition of my soul is he's made marvelous his loving kindness to me. He's made, yeah, he's made big his goodness to me. The city, I mean, some, some people might feel that way about living in Asheville. <laughs> it's like the city seems besieged or my circumstances seem besieged. So the city I'm in, the circumstances around me might be besieged, but within my heart, and within my soul, God's made marvelous his loving kindness to me. I think one of the great stories that uh, helps us understand why it's so powerful is Jacob, who's on a journey um, in, in Genesis 28. And I want us to, to look at this story for just a minute because I do think when, when you start to recognize the goodness of God within your own heart, it eventually seeps out into all of your world. So Genesis 28, 11 says, Jacob came to a certain place, spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of that place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. <sighs> Jacob, stoned. We just celebrated 420 yesterday, right? <laughs> Jacob stoned. What do you what do you say? Um, <laughs> I don't think that's what it meant. <laughs> when you're laying your head on a stone to sleep, you're not having a good night. You're not having a good day. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the throne with its top reaching to heaven. Behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on that ladder, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I'm going to give it to you. He's reminding him of his goodness. He's reminding him of his loving kindness. He's reminding him of his faithfulness. He said, Behold, I'm with you. I'll keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land for I'll not leave you until I've done what I promised you. So God is speaking something into Jacob's soul. And then verse 18 says, Jacob rose early in the morning. He took the stone that he put under his head. He set it up as a pillar. He poured oil on its top and he called the name of that place Bethel, which meant house of God. However, previously the name of that city had been Luz. And let me just point out a couple of thoughts here is that one, the very stone he was lying on he became an altar of worship. God can turn my mess into a message. God can turn your test into a testimony. And he, he wakes up from this dream where he's reminded of the faithfulness of God and reminded of the goodness of God and reminded of the promise of God. And now, a, a, a city that had been called Luz, a city that did feel besieged to him, now he rises up and says, this is the house of God. Nothing had changed in the city yet, but something had changed in Jacob. And when your outlook changes, when your outlook understands the goodness of God, I promise you, your circumstances are going to change too. I want to pray with you guys. I want you to bow your heads and I want you to close your eyes, please. And I just want to say a prayer real quick. Father, we thank you that you are leaning in to us with your goodness. We thank you that no matter how frail or human we are, you never change, you never waver, and you are wanting to speak into our soul right now. I believe that there are people in this room that are going through as tough a time as David was in Psalm 31, but you can speak a word of life and a word of hope into them that will lift them 
to a brand new place. And I'm believing you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, would you take a minute, would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and we're just going to stand before the Lord. You know, you may not be able to locate hope in your circumstances right now, but hope can come and can arise from the goodness of God. And Easter is certainly God's proof that there's no enemy too great. No situations too far out of hand that God cannot enter in and bring life. God can redeem. God can restore. God would love to reveal his goodness to you today. But you do have to open the door of your heart to allow him into your life, to surrender to him. And so nobody's looking around. I just want to take this moment. Maybe you're here today and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. I would love to pray with you. Maybe you're here today and you can look back certainly to a time where you used to be close to the Lord, but you know you're not today. Or maybe you don't feel confident about where you stand with God. I just want to take a moment to pray. And and really more important than me praying is, For you to signal to heaven, God, I'm opening my life to you. I want to surrender. I need you. I need your love. I need your lordship. I need your goodness in my life. If you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I just want you to lift your hand real high right now all over this room and just say, yeah, that's me. I, I need Jesus in my life. I want to surrender to God. I want to come back to him. Thank you. Thanks all over the room. Come on, just open up your heart. To God, this isn't, a, this isn't a call to get your act together. This is a call to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. He'll, God bless you all over the room. Thank you so much. Anybody else just want to be included in this moment? Anybody else just want to signal to God, 
I need you. I want you in my life. Thank you. Hey, let's pray a prayer together. This is for everybody who lifted their hand, but I love it when we all say these kind of things together. Easter Sunday is a great day to do it. Everybody say, Lord Jesus, I open my life to your love, to your lordship. I need you. I want you in my world as my Lord. I know I've sinned, so I come to the cross where you paid the price for my forgiveness. Today is a fresh start. It's a new beginning. As I surrender to you, help me become the person you created me to be. Amen.